Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the international bestseller called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. Today on the show, we have Jane Siebold coming to us from Phoenix, Arizona, here in the United States of America. Jane is a psychic, evidential medium, energy healer, ordained minister, national spiritualist teacher, and Reiki master. With that list, you can tell that she is someone who's been a seeker of the truth for a very long time. Jane's passion is to assist people and give practical guidance for all looking to have better lives. She has so much wisdom and so many great stories to share that I've asked her to be our guest today. You can find out more about Jane on her website, which is janesebold.com. Jane, my friend, a welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Hi, how are you, Sandra? Nice to be here. Thank you. You're welcome. It's nice to catch up with you, too, and just chat and find out about you. And we met back at the Afterlife Symposium weekend back in Scottsdale. That was spectacular. Yeah, that was really spectacular, especially, you know, with all the different, you know, speakers that were there. And then, of course, there was a lady that had um, her son that came through in the picture. Oh, well, we need to talk more about that. So we're not going to forget that uh-huh. because that is a, for our listener, you don't know what that's about, but we're going to, well, why don't you just share? Because um, this is an example of a, more than a sign from a loved one. It's actually in a picture, a loved one shows up. So before we find out about you, why don't you just talk about that? Um, so I was at the Afterlife Conference and I was a vendor there and um, a woman and her daughter came up to me to get a reading and she had lost her son and the daughter the brother and um, during the conversation the son had brought through that he had three little girls and that he was particularly concerned about the middle child uh, there seemed to be a really really very strong connection still between the two of them and she was only seven years old and so um, when the reading concluded uh, the mother asked me if she could bring the granddaughter back. And I said, yeah. And so she brought her granddaughter back later that afternoon. And um, she told the little girl what I did. And when she told her what I did, she just melted and started to break down in tears. And uh, so grandma put her on her lap. And sometimes, you know, we don't have all the answers, but I always figured that the spirit world does. Right. And so I asked the spirit world if they would come behind the dad so that the communication could take place in a way that the little girl would understand. And um, pretty soon her sobbing stopped and she perked up her little head and she said that she felt her daddy. And from that moment on, you know, she kind of perked up and jumped off the lap and they took off and left. And, you know, we had talked about pictures. But that was it. And then the mother came back to me and she said, you're not going to believe this. She said, I went to take a picture in the lobby and she said, everything turned white. And when she said that, I thought, oh, I recognize that. And I said, let me see the picture. And she said, well, my phone, it, it drained the battery on my phone. And I thought, that's another great sign. Wow. And what she showed me was the most amazing a picture of her son that actually had projected himself into the picture. It was amazing. And I think I sent it to you, too. You, you did send it to me, and I've just got goosebumps on my arms just <laughs> knowing the power and yeah. the possibilities. And so, <laughs> and so it was so funny because the the sister had a phone, too, and the mother's phone was, you know, dying or almost dead. And so the sister started taking pictures, and she also captured a picture. Very nice. He's a very powerful soul, that man. <laughs> yes, but it transformed that little girl into someone that knew that her daddy was still around. Mm-hmm. And that she can still talk to daddy, and that daddy can respond. Yeah. It changed her life. Absolutely. It was amazing. It was a feel-good, happy time. <laughs> It's really great because I think of children and grief and there's not too much unless there's not too much shared about the afterlife and grief normally. And 
yes, if there's children that belong to a family that believe in this, great. But for others, no. So to be able to have, well, the pictures are amazing. And um, just to have that knowing growing up, because I can't even imagine losing a parent when I'm young and then spending the rest of my life with not, not having them. So thank you for giving her that knowing that dad's still around. When she had the communication from her dad and she was convinced you had to, you know, get a a picture in your mind of this little girl. Her, her hair was kind of like straw and it was like shoulder length. So she didn't comb it and she had no shoes on and she was about as skinny as a rail. And you saw this little kid that had been a puddle of tears transform into this little one that was now dancing around. She caught everybody's attention. Oh, that's beautiful. All the vendors were like, oh my God, this is precious, you know, to see that connection take place. And that's why you do what you do to make those connections. Oh yeah. As fascinating as mediumship is, it, it heals a grieving heart and gives hope and gets people back living again. Instead of dying, again. it does. Yeah. It does, and and it's so powerful to be just a small part of that process. Mm. Well, Jane, tell us about you. Where, about how me. this, yeah, hey. how this all began. You getting into this wonderful world, and um, yeah, if you could tell us a little bit about your story. Well, you know, I'm kind of. You might want to call me a reluctant medium because I never wanted to ever do this. Really, and I. Oh no. I never set out to do this, no. In fact, you know, I was raised in a very Catholic family, and my mother was psychic, and she was uh, deathly afraid of it. And during that time, you have to look back, and, you know, it wasn't the best time to be a psychic, and there certainly weren't the resources that there are today. And so she was afraid of it, and here was, I, you know, a reminder of it. Now, not only am I psychic, but I'm also, you know, talking to the dead. And it was just more than she could deal with, bless her heart. So, you know, we had a pretty dysfunctional relationship my whole life until um, she was very ill. And when she was very ill, she asked me if I would stay with her, you know, while she was going through the transitioning process. And I just, you know, my whole life, even though I had done this, I still was a skeptic, if you can believe that, (laughs) because it hadn't happened to me. I could see it with other people, but it never happened to me. Okay. So when she was transitioning, I said, hey, look, you know what? It it would be really nice if you would send me proof back of the afterlife. And she said, okay. And, you know, years went by and I, I didn't hear anything from her. And so I thought, well, maybe she forgot, but I knew she was very tenacious. Whatever she put her mind to, she would do. And so that kind of was in the back of my head. But like on my 54th birthday, um, she came through with a bang. And a five and a four is a nine. And it was the ending of what was considered to be that life that I had been living up to that point. And boy, did it turn a new chapter in my life. Can you be and that, more specific of like what happened? Because... Um... And I came home and I hate pictures. <laughs> My husband said, I have this birthday card for you and I want you to read it. And I said, okay. So I sat down on the couch and I'm reading this birthday card and he takes the camera out and he starts snapping these pictures. And he said, I think there's something wrong. He said, look, there's a shaft of light. It's over your heart. It's coming. I think the camera is broke. And I looked at it and I said, it can't be broke because the stationary objects are moving. And then so we took more pictures, and it dawned on me, oh, my gosh, I think we have communication. And so that's when I actually started saying, if this is you, can you do this? And if it's, can you do that? And then we got the response from it, and I was over the moon. I was just over the moon. And so that... Did you ask for that she did? Oh, well, I wanted to know how the energy ran. And Mm -hmm. so in So my energy runs very circular where my husband's is very different. And so we got to see how that worked. I wanted to know how the transfiguration worked on a projection. So they projected um, uh, a male face over mine. 
And so there were different things. The male, actually, when I was going through my family pictures, I believe that that is my grandfather. So it was, it was amazing. So it was not only faces of those that I love, which is including hers, but it was um, symbols like crosses, um, very significant because I had a cross on my neck um, the day that she was buried and I actually took it off and I wove it through her hands. And so, you know, that came through too. So these were things that were totally meaningful to me. And then we started having more interactions where I wanted to actually know if I sent her out a symbol, could she send the symbol back? She did. These would show up on pictures? Um, It would show up on pictures. I had my husband draw a heart, and he drew this... uh, heart that looked like a normal one on one side and pretty flat on the other. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I, we don't have time, so we'll just have to use what we have. And so I had him project it out as my intent was for her to send that back to me, to let me know that she had received it. And she did. And so I'm snapping the pictures because I've already sealed it with the intent before and he's projecting it. We received that back. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So then it really became, if I can do this, can other people do it? Mm-hmm. I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I did. I started teaching other people how to communicate. And so that we would have these parties where people would call in their loved ones and they would get the orbs that would come in or they would get the symbols in the orbs, you know? And so it's a progression. And I like to work with people because I believe it's only when you have that personal experience does it change your life forever, and it changes it in the most magnificent and beautiful way. It just heals. I I know that. There's things that I've experienced that I try to explain to people, and while it sounds great, it doesn't do anything for them. But to have a personal experience that you just know. You know, you mentioned crosses. The sun was coming into my bedroom not too long ago, and I look up, and there was a perfect cross on the wall. And I could not figure out how the light could have made that. And I just took a picture of it and took that as a little divine sign. Isn't that wonderful, though? Mm -hmm. It is. And and when talking about orbs, I'm, I'm on the fence with the orb conversation. And not that I don't believe in them, but... I've done plenty of my own research of filming and taking pictures after shaking up a blanket. And especially if the flash is on, there's all kinds of, I think they're dust particles. Now I've also seen people that have captured them and I don't think they're dust particles because there's either a face in them or like you said, there's a symbol in them. So yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so I've had, like, animals show up in mine. I have a baby that showed up in mine. Um, I have intricate pattern designs that are very um, uh, geometric in shape. Mm -hmm. Um, And so it's not something that can be created by a dust particle. But then I also have, like, a massive um, gathering uh, and it was up in Panther Meadows in Mount Shasta where it looked like a constellation of them that formed a face. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it, think about it. If we're not with our bodies, I would get together with you and say, hey, Sandra, I need to project this. Would you help me? And that's ba- basically what it's like on the other side. You know, they'll get together to help project whatever needs to be projected. So there's teamwork there because I I know I'm of the belief that when we transition, we don't have all the answers in the universe and all knowing wisdom. So for them to communicate back with us, they have to learn what you're saying and they have to work with others. Right. That's why my mother took so long over there is because when she hit, she hit the, it took her a while to learn how to communicate. I expected that when she just went over that she would know. But, you know, after I, after she transitioned and after I got my communication, I really went into understanding, you know, what, what the process is. 
and it is a learning curve. Hmm. And some can come back very quickly and communicate, and others, it takes time. But you got to remember, there is no time on their side. Right. Right. Yeah. So what so could I mean, be what seems- 10 years for us could be a blink <laughs> of an eye for them. A blink of a night, yeah, to her. Wow. Jane, how did you get involved with mediumship to begin with? Um, my grandmother, who I loved very, very dearly, um, when she passed, um, I was really connected with her, and I was really beyond sad when she left. But um, she came to me, and she told me she was okay. And she had um, been sick before she passed. And I remember that when we were at the funeral, um, there was some music that was played. And my mother had said, oh, it was her favorite music. And my grandmother had said, no, it wasn't. It was hers. <laughs> and when I relayed that to my mom, my mom wasn't too happy. But um, it was the most incredible, beautiful, meaningful connection to the spirit world that last, I mean, it was the reference point that I always went back to that this is what it is, no matter what I was being taught in school. And so that's what I stayed with until and I started doing it on the side and, but I would really didn't have a name for it. I would just do it. And, um, it, I think it was like in 99, I just said, well, it's about time to really start really understanding more. And so my husband and I, found a little spiritualist church. I think it was in 2001 or 2002. And we started working in there. But I never had any, I I never had an intent to really go out public and do anything. Not at all. Yeah. Could you just mention what a spiritualist? Jane. Uh, Yeah. I said, sometimes God has plan. Yeah, thank you for that. The, the magic of the internet here is connected through energy, but sometimes we have little glitches, so I lost you for a second. <laughs> yeah. But I, I think it recorded it. Can you just mention what the spiritualist churches are? Because I, I don't think people know, or many people don't know, that that can be a great resource. Um, so I found people that thought like me, and I, I cannot tell you how important that was to be able to be around people that were of the same thinking, that weren't critical, they were very open um, in the exploration of the psychic senses. <clears throat> and so what happened is, is that, you know, we had this little, um, she was an older medium. And that's what you have in the spiritualist churches is if you have the older mediums to guide the new ones that come in, <clears throat> excuse me, And I remember, you know, she said, well, this is what you can do. And she told me that, you know, I would be getting up and giving greetings. And I said, no. And I, you know, went home and I thought she was kidding. And uh, she wasn't. And I'm glad that she didn't give me much warning because I, you know, was basket case afterwards. But what I realized was, is that there was a natural talent there. And it wasn't something that I was working at as much as I was allowing it to happen, if that makes sense. Yes. And so the more I allowed and the more I got out of my way, the more accurate I became instead of thinking about what I was getting, just giving it. And that's really the spiritualist, you know, their basis is is that they believe in life after death because life is eternal. Mm -hmm. And so, um, having the camaraderie of other people that were like-minded and thinking thinking gave me the, the foundation, you know, and the security of starting to develop. And so um, I did, in fact, you know, I was doing like readings for like $5 in the church and sometimes we'd get up to like, Oh, 20, 25, 30 people. And um, then I got my, communication from my mom and my life turned and that's when I got cancer the same year. Can you talk about that? And so I really, sure. I think that, you know, there's this divine plan for you and, um, 
sometimes we listen and sometimes we don't. And I had been very good about not listening. Right. <laughs> and so when I got it, you know, like I said, it was a nine year, it was an ending and it was really a beginning of a new chapter in my life. And I, you know, recovered from that. I had kidney cancer and I recovered from that and went and quit my job and went public. I, I finally decided that I would follow what I had been called to do. And since then, I, you know, I have to say it has been the most glorious and the most, you know, it, you have your ups and downs, but sure. I wouldn't trade it for anything. It's been wonderful. Okay. And to see the transformation in other people has been amazing. Mm -hmm. And I know from so many people that have had life-threatening illnesses, diseases, things like that, that it's a wake-up call to oh, it is. who are it is. you and what's, it's on, what's my life what for? What matters in life. Yes. <laughs> it, what matters in life. And that's really what became really important to me because we had been on a trip and I had gotten sick. And um, I wound up in a small little hospital and um, they sent me home with a letter. <laughs> they send you home with a letter. It's not a good sign. <laughs> and uh, I no sooner got off the plane that I was in the hospital again. And that's when I ended up having, you know, they found out that I had kidney cancer. Oh, wow. Yeah, but it was, it's, I always say that, you know, we get these things in our life and it's not really, you know, because we're having the human experience, mm -hmm. we couldn't have it without contrast. And so it's how do we then deal with the contrast that's happening in our life? Mm -hmm. So we're moving from really the problem into the solution. And the solution had always been was to follow what I knew to be true, but I didn't have the courage to do it. Right. And can you talk a little bit about and healing? Because I know you mentioned you do energy healing and you're Reiki master. And I have known people that have had these tremendous healings. And could you just talk a little bit about that? I don't really know what my question is, but I think you'll, you'll know and okay. you'll speak of it. So for like me, I had energy blocks. I had blocked the energy. And when everything happens in the non-physical before it is manifested in the physical, and so I had to own that. And so the environment of the body, from, from my thinking, we now know that the belief becomes the biology of the body. And so when we think very negative, it releases a negative re chemical response in the body, and the body creates the environment for myself, you know, I'll talk about myself, for the cancer cells to be turned on. And so when I understood that, then it was like, if they can turn on, they can turn off. And so what I did is I started looking at how people, you know, where they hide their blocks in the body and how it's affecting them. And I always say that, you know, we're on this major learning curve and sometimes we get information that we don't understand and it doesn't become applicable until you're working on somebody and you're saying, how did I do that? It's because the knowledge is already there. And so it takes the, the situation and the person to actually activate it. And that's really what happened. I found somebody that I was reading that they had a tremendous number of blocks, but they wanted and they were, they really wanted to move them. And what I did is I started moving the energy and I could see the transformation before my eyes. And I said, wow. And then I just started building on that. But many times, you know, we can have energy that's stuck in the field for maybe somebody, you know, as this 80 year old woman, I did a reading for the one that, you know, felt that her mother had abandoned her and you know didn't love her that was stuck in her field so to have that moved out of her field it freed her up energetically and to how, be a more healthier how and, do you see that obviously it's with your mind's eye right yeah i see it but i feel it so i you know I, I, everything i do is remote so i'm just you know scanning the field and then i look to see how it's manifesting in a person's body Remote? And then, you know, what I'll do. Is, I don't mean to interrupt oh, yeah. you. Everything. Remote meaning? Like, no, no. Everything is remote. But does that mean 
on somebody who's, you can do that on somebody halfway around the world remote or they have to be with you? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. Remote is there. They can be anywhere in the world. Mm. Energy is energy. And so we're just tapping into the energy field and reading the energy field. And then when we start moving it and, you know, most, most of the time what you'll find is disease is a very low frequency. And so when you start to raise the vibration, what it does is it shifts the person. Sometimes people have a hard time shifting out of maybe grief or depression or um, anxiety or worry. And then what happens is, is that they just kind of get this energetic boost and they get up there and they go, you know what? I don't want to go back down there again. And so it, it, it's, it's a very nice way of, in a very natural way of just healing. Yeah, this is a topic I don't know much of. And so that's why I'm asking questions and interrupting you all the time. Have you witnessed or know of physical healings that have taken place? Yeah, I worked on a young man that he had been to um, a lot of different doctors and he was diagnosed with a abnormal chromosome and um, he was non-functional. And um, I worked on him and his mother and she said that he ended up, he was having a little trouble in school and then she said that he ended up working at the Y and he started functioning. And so sometimes I think it's like if we're highly sensitive people and that's what we're coming into now seeing is that these children, I want to say these newer models of us are coming in and they're really highly sensitive and they don't know how to deal with their sensitivity because no one trains them. And so what happens is, is that they start taking on everybody's energies and then they react to them. But when you clear their field out, then they feel good again. And that helped the boy in his health. I, what did you say? And that, that helped the boy in his health. Um, what it did is it allowed him to gain control of himself. So he felt more grounded, more in his body, didn't want to, you know, um, do the fight or flight. Yeah. And so um, I think right now he's in California. So, yeah, and um, I've had where it alleviates pain. Um, we did a an event over here at um, the local college, I think college or church, and a woman had, um, she had an aversion to the color orange, which was really interesting. And she said, um, looking at it, she said it was because orange was associated with her mother. And it was showing up as a physical problem in her body. But when we got the energy of mom unattached from her, she no longer had the physical problem. That's just amazing. I, I totally believe and buy into energy thing. I mean, from a science point of view, everything's made up of energy. And I know for you being a medium, being able to tap into, say, the little girl's father who's right there with you or tapping into somebody halfway around the world, you can do that because of that, that energy field. So I find it very interesting with the energy and physicality and, the, and bodies and healing and all that sort of thing. Uh, I think we are so much more powerful than we know. And so um, that's why I love hearing about it. I think you're absolutely right. And what you do, just by what you do, you give people the opportunity to awaken to who they truly are and what they can truly do. Mm. It's a magnificent it's magnificent. Yeah. And even just speaking of energy, uh, yesterday, or was that the day before yesterday, I woke up with a zillion things on my to-do list, woke up on the wrong side of the bed, <laughs> just really, like, I could have let the day go that way, but something and told me said, internally said, you know, I can change my energy. So I have, um, I don't want to say her name too loud, Alexa, <laughs> you know, yeah, she heard me, <laughs> with Amazon. And I just had her play some of the songs that were my favorite dance songs when I was in high school. And, uh, yeah. mm -hmm. and, uh, 
And I just started dancing around my living room as crappy as I felt. And I, I shifted my energy. <laughs> but what I did is I shifted my energy. I mean, that's the way I did it. And I went on to have a really great day. And so I think we so often we wait for things to happen or we can't feel happy unless such and such ha- happens. But it, it's not that. We can put in the being and the feeling and shift that energy and then we can have a result that follows. Immediate. Immediate result. Yeah. I mean, I love music, but, you know, whatever way you can shift it, Mm -hmm. shift it. (laughs) And and gratitude is a way, right? Gratitude? Um, Yes. Gratitude will get you out of any funk because it's kind of like, you know, when we start looking at what's working in life versus what's not working in life, gratitude opens us up to the potentiality of expressing us at a much higher level. Mm-hmm. And we get more we get more when we are thankful for what we have. It's amazing. I like it. Yeah. I, I mean even something as silly as putting a smile on your face for 30 seconds. I remember hearing about that growing up, but there is something about that. And I've I've tried the practice of writing down 10 or 20 things that I'm grateful for. And like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to feel great at gratitude, but to force myself through it, all of a sudden on the other side of it, it's like, oh my gosh, I feel great. And I know people that are extremely negative and I kind of, from a distance, watch how their life goes versus people that I know don't have very much money, have had very poor health uh, and a lot of things happen to them, but holding the happy mindset, just how they live their life. I mean, it just, it, it's very interesting. And I know that spiritual healing and things like that, physical healing may not always happen with people, but I do think there is an emotional or spiritual healing that always does take place when the intent is there. Oh, absolutely. I mean, can you imagine having cancer and being grateful that you had cancer? That's what I did. Mm. It was only when I, it was only when I began to love my cancer instead of you always hear people say fight it, fight it. No, right. no, 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 no. You 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 embrace it. You embrace it, and you know it's taught me so much. I mean, I can't even believe it. But you know, like I said before, you know, we need the contrast in order to spiritually evolve, and it's really how we deal with it. Or don't deal with it. Yeah, it's so true. And life is a learning experience. And if I look back, it, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's the most painful it, it, things it, it, that it, give me the most growth. Bluntly said. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm. I, but here's the thing: growth never happens in a you know green garden. <laughs> it just doesn't. Growth mm-hmm. is always through adversity. Yes. And so, you know, I got to tell you, it's just when I look back and I think about the people that I've seen, you know, I have a friend um, and when I did a reading for her, I met her at a Raymond Moody conference. And she was so funny because I brought her her friend who was a doctor at Mayo Clinic. And I did not know that there was a statue at the time that was dedicated to this doctor. And she brought in birds and it's actually the it's a bird shaman woman statue. So she brought in birds and my friend is such a skeptic. And um, even though I was there when her father transitioned, right? And so we're at the funeral and she has like a hundred people at this funeral. It's outside and we, there is this tent and it sounded like this roaring sound of you know when they turn the blowers on and they're blowing leaves that's what it sounded like yes. and we're looking all over we're sitting in the back row we're looking all over and we see this dust devil that is roaring down the side of the tent outside and it drops into his open grave a hundred people saw that and mm-hmm. to this day nobody has an explanation for it and when he was military and when they were playing the taps, there were black butterflies and one monarch that was uh, flying around this guy. 
Now, my skeptic friend said that was very interesting, and she had no explanation for that. But um, we were talking about her friend that had been a doctor at Mayo Clinic. And I said, look, you can communicate with her. Why don't you try this? So she got her camera out. She took some pictures. And a couple days later, she sent me these pictures back and with a comment that said, nothing but a bunch of squiggly lines. And when I looked at it, it was a bird. And I called her up and I said, hey, look, I want you to know that this is a bird. Look at it. Here's the beak and here's the wings. And when she did, she still couldn't believe it. So what does she do? She writes canon because she thinks there's a malfunction in the cam uh, in the camera. And when she did, Canon wrote her back and said that there wasn't an uh, explanation that they could give for the picture that was taken. Interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, we have skepticism, but then at what point do you, when you have such profound things happening, do you move that from skepticism to belief? Mm-hmm. Even being when the person can open, that. because I know I've been a skeptic my life, but when you take a moment, and if I can get myself out of my body and comfort zone here, we are living on a planet that's one of billions and billions of planets in a universe that we will never comprehend. And so when we are living in our day to day lives, we think we know it all. We've got to see it or smell it or taste it or hear it or feel it for it to be real. Um, and I think part of that is coming into earth and living a human life is we forget who we really are. So we buy into this, this idea and we end up being skeptic to nothing else is possible. But then if we take that outside view and try to have that view from the universe, <laughs> looking down, like there's so much we don't understand. So just, we, we might not ever figure out how those squiggly lines or those, the father showed up on that photograph, but to be open to it's possible. And I think once we can open our mind to things are possible, more things can start happening. Oh, yes. It, it, it can be a landslide of things that begin to happen. But, you know, often too, you'll find people that when they have that chink in the armor where they 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 just have the just the tiniest of possibility they'll start smelling smoke you know or they'll smell you know perfume mm -hmm. and you know but they can't make the connection or they'll hear the song on the radio and they'll say you know it's almost like they knew what i was thinking and it's because they're only a thought away yeah, I, only a thought away. I love that. When I first started getting into this wild and wonderful world, I started knowing songs that would come on the radio just before they came on. And I, I'm i like, how can that be? And then I would know who's calling me when the phone rang, even so much as I'd hear like the name Shannon. And it would be a telemarketer. Ooh calling 10 minutes later. Hello, this is Shannon calling from XYZ company trying to sell you something. And how would I know that? So it was those kind of things that really opened the door for me that if that's possible, what else is possible? And so hence, therefore, I'm definitely on this spiritual adventure as well. Well, you know, I, I got to the point where it was like when I was reading somebody, I could actually go into the dream state and see the, the communication between the, the, the loved ones, the ones living and non-living. And I remember the first time I was able to see that. It's probably when the, the two worlds are the closest mm -hmm. it, because it seems so real. And many times people have the experiences, but they they try and rationalize it. They rationalize it away until somebody says, "Hey, wait a minute, you had that. That was that was a that was an experience," mm -hmm. and they get the validation for it. It's life changing. It is. Speaking of life changing, <laughs> I want to hear about your <laughs> husband because doesn't he, does he have any psychic gifts or is he into this as well? Actually, um, when my when I met my husband. Um, it was the 
I always say God works in the most mysterious mm-hmm. ways. It was like you know, October, November, and I was offered a job in a satellite office. And um, I would have to go from the top of the pay scale down to the bottom, but I decided that I would. It was his first day back from bereavement leave. So his wife had just passed in like December 21st. And um, I met him January 4th. That was my first day at the office. And that was his first day back. And um, my cube would often fill up with lavender because that was his wife's favorite smell. And um, we met in January. I think we went out in February. And I loved his attitude because, you know, he always said about me, you know, you were the only person that I could talk to that, you know, really understood this. And I, and it was because I knew that we just transitioned. We dropped the body, but we're still here. And, you know, his motto was, he said, you know, I don't know how long I have but he said, I just want to be happy. Yeah. And I thought, wow. And so many times people, when they lose somebody, they get in the grief and it becomes very, they get very stuck. But he just, he wanted to move through it because she had had cancer. I think it was two or three times and, you know, during an eight year period. And he just wanted to be happy again. And um, he took me to my first meditation class. And his wife became a very prominent figure within the first six months of us, you know, dating. She was very prominent with information. So he, I had insight on his relationship that helped him move through the grief process at a, you know, much faster rate of speed. And then, you know, he said at one point, he goes, and he says, you know what? He said, what you do is really healing. And he said, it's not fair that you just, you know, don't do it for the public. He said, you really need to just get out there and do it. And he's been like my biggest supporter. He was the one that, you know, got behind me and said, you know, do it. It, it It's transforming. And so, yeah, he has some psychic ability. He's more of a healer than he is psychic. But um, as far as somebody that can really keep you planted and grounded and understands that happiness is fleeting, I mean, we're only here for a very short time. Right. And so we want to move into that happy happiness as much as we can experience it. What's your husband's first name? Rick. Rick. Well, I'm excited to meet Rick. Jane is going to be one of our speakers at the upcoming We Don't Die Boston event, February 2019, which I'm very excited about. And Rick will be coming with you, correct? Yes, he will. And I'm excited to be able to share with others how to really communicate with their loved ones. Capture them on picture. We 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 all have the ability. We just need to know that we can. Wow. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited. One of the reasons I, I like you there is you've got so much history in this world. You're somebody who's willing to do one-on-one readings and energy shifting and all that stuff for people at the event while we're there. So you can have some one-on-one time with Jane. Um, and I am fascinated really about the photographs and even more so than that, the shifting of the energy, because I know we had spoken on the phone a couple of weeks ago, talking about moving from grieving to gratitude, shifting the energy, and then also these pictures. So I I had asked Jane if she could create a talk on all of the above. And so many of us, I know, um, especially right now, it's holiday times, 2018, when we're recording this episode, it can be tough. And so to get some good tools to shift that energy can be healing in so many ways. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The the best thing is, you know, I always say, if you have a loved one that you're missing, say hello. And then wait. Here's the simple, simple exercise. Say hello and ask them to send you something back that you would recognize. So maybe, you know, start out simple, like maybe six red cars in a row. Or something 
that you can build on. And then what you find is that when you start out with a communication in something simple, you can start building to get more precise communication. I like it. Because on their side, too, I mean, we have to imagine and trust this is a real conversation you're having with a real person, even though you may not see them. And so to start working on that different kind of relationship, being in communication, it's things you would do with someone else. If you and I wanted to plan a project, we would be communicating often about it. We'd be like, oh, okay, I saw this. This happened. How are we going to build on this for next time? And we all have the power to do that, even though you may be speaking to an visible chair in front of you. They are there. Oh, yeah. But, you know, the thing of it is, is that it has to be interactive. Just like you said, it has to be interactive. It can't be one-sided. It's where I put out the intent, and then I wait for you to give me, you know, it's like I'm knocking on your door. Hey, Sandra. And then, you know, you're answering it. And so many times we forget that, you know, we just don't know what to do. So we don't do anything, but we expect it. Does that make sense? It is. And I just started laughing inside because I just got this visual of you knocking on my front door, but not really convinced (laughs) whether I'm there or not. And so you turn around and you leave and I've got the door wide open. Like, Hey, (laughs) where'd you go? (laughs) I'm right here. (laughs) And I think that could be it for our loved ones too. Just, I know their love and all that stuff, but a little bit of frustration that, come on, I want to be with you. I want to play with you. Let's, let's, let's do this. Uh, Jane, I would love it if you would tell the story of what you posted on Facebook, because it is such a great story of something that just happened. And I think the listeners here would, would love to hear about that. So I had read for this elderly lady. She's in her eighties, beautiful lady. Absolutely. I mean, you would not, when you look at her, you would never know that she was 80 years old. And um, when I would read for her, she would say, well, you all, you know, that my mother didn't want me. And that would be the, how she would preface, you know, when I would meet her. And so she decided that she would have a private reading. And so I met with her and of course she started off the conversation with, well, you know, my mother didn't want me. And um, I asked her, I said, who would you like to speak to? And I'm thinking it would be really nice sending out the the mental hello to the spirit world and saying it would be really nice if mom would show up and mom popped in. And um, mom, she, mom had been gone for many years. And um, when I told her that her mother was there, she seemed quite surprised. And um, her mom started detailing um the places, the two houses that she lived in during critical turning points in her life. And so her mother was giving me a floor plan of what the houses looked like. And, and this lady agreed. And she was flabbergasted that her mother would be watching and had known about this when she thought that, you know, her mother didn't want anything to do with her. And um, then her mother brought up about the roses. And she said, yes, I have, you know, roses in my yard that, you know, my mother loved. And she said the the crowns of the heads of them are extremely large this year. And um, I said, she's talking about that, but she's also talking about a Christmas present that's coming. And she thought that was quite funny. (laughs) And I, you know, sometimes I think the most wildest things that we get are probably the most accurate. Mm-hmm. And so I quit reading and didn't think too much of it. And I got an email from her um, last week that said, Jane, <laughs> um, I got a $500 check. And she said, I, I didn't know where it came from. And so I called the place and she said, my mother had taken that out. And she said, she took it out in 1942 and it matured in 1961 and they've been looking for me ever since. She said, I got my Christmas present. I thought that was pretty cool. That is great. That is great. But mom knew. Yeah. You just never know. And just for all of us to 
think today and as much as you can really to be open, open for the, and I call them miracles, but I don't even think they're miracles. I think this is just regular because we're souls. We really are. And we do have so much power available to us, but it may lie dormant because we have forgotten who we are. Think of the orchestration it took on the other side for that to make it happen. Mm-hmm. I, can't I mean, I'm just all, I know, but I'm always, it never ceases to amaze me what spirit can and will do to make communication happen. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Jane, I want, before we close the episode, you mentioned a few times intent, intention. Can you talk about what that is and how we do it and, and why that's a powerful force? Um, everything that is in the physical is first birthed in the non-physical and it's created by thought. And so the thought is the, the, the foundation of your intention. And so when you crystallize your intention, you're, you're beginning to form it. And then when you send it out, you're allowing it then to manifest in this dimension. Does that make sense to you? It does. What would be an example, though, of having an intent over something? I want to send out a communication that my mother can hear me and I want a cross. Okay. I'm sending that, I'm sending that symbol out. I want you to hear me and I want you to send that cross back to me. And it can be in the sky. It can be in the form of a, you know, uh, being a sunlight. It can be anything, but I want that cross to be specific and I want it to look like this. And so, you know, you go from the, you know, the cross to, I want it to look like something on the cross. And I actually got a picture of, you know, because, you know, I was raised Catholic and so I have a cross that where it looks like Jesus is on the cross. And so, you know, when I put the intention out, it was like, that's very meaningful at a very deep level to me. Very, very meaningful. And so if, if she can send that to me, I, I got it. Mm-hmm. And she did. And so when we were, we're sending, go ahead. Oh, sorry. It's, it's so no, hard when it's, we're not face to face. So like, because I can't tell when to jump in. <laughs> You can finish your thought just, and then I'll share mine. You, you just send it out. And then as you send it out and you get it back, you start to be more specific in what you want. Mm. The example I was going to use is um, the power of prayer. Uh, also being raised Catholic, I have memorized all those prayers that we said in church. But there was never, it was just me repeating them. There was never any real prayer or belief or I, or even paying attention to what the words are. So I think with intention, it's, it's like having the emotion, the trust, the faith tied in with that request as opposed to just some words you say, right? Get the emotions. 100%. Yeah. You have to, there has to be, I want to call it the, um, when we're aligned with that, which is all that is, there is a a faith that is transcending. It's just a trust. I have trust in the spirit world. Not if it will happen, when it will happen. Mm -hmm. And it puts a smile on my face. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Because you just know it. I don't remember the expression that I heard, but it it is trusting, even though we don't understand that everything that's happening in our lives is for our benefit. And Mm -hmm. and now somebody listening right now could be going through the most horrific thing. So I'm not making light of that at all. But I just know for me and my grief and the death of my dad and going through the most painful period I've ever had which I didn't even think I was going to live through. And now fast forward eight years, it was really the catalyst that gave birth to who I am right now as this, the person that I am, this, all the difference that I'm making and my drive to help people through grief, this radio show and all that. So the worst thing that happened to me 
really has caused the best thing. So it is having that faith and trust that all is well. We might not understand it, um, but there's so much a bigger picture than just our lives here on earth. It's just so much bigger picture. Well, I had lost my nephew and um, I, really I'd lost track of him because he got into drugs and he came to me in the dream state for over a year with the same dream. And I had never, 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 um, never had tried to locate someone that way. Mm -hmm. And, um, I was able to through not only the dream, but using a pendulum and taking a map of the United States, I was able to find him. But because I had lost touch with his dad, um, we had kind of lost that connection. Um, so I understand what it's, I mean, in many ways, I felt like he should have been my son. But so, yes, grief. Grief is um, something that it's difficult. There's no doubt about it. But it is also the wall that keeps us from feeling our loved ones too. Oh. And so when we move past that wall of grief, we're able then to connect with our loved ones. And even it, that happened to me too. I mean, so, you know, just because we're in the business and we do this, it doesn't mean that we're not, we don't have the same issues. And I found that to be very, when I could move past the whys and everything and how, because it was very tragic, um, then I could feel him. Mm. It was really interesting. Grief is something that we'd all like to just turn off, turn the switch off <laughs> so we don't feel it, but it is part of being human. And for our listener, if you've been on this show or listened to the show before, I offer a free audio called How to Survive Grief that's on the We Don't Die Radio.com website. Um, and, uh, and I know. Jane is open for healing and coaching and medium readings and so much more. And if you do need somebody to talk to, she's not, as you can tell by this show, she's not a, not a bad person to have a conversation with. I want to say that grief is the depth of your love. Yes. Well, I've got a pretty deep reservoir of love then I'd say. <laughs> as, oh, as so many do as well. Uh, Jane, how do people get in touch with you? Um, I'm my website, janesebold.com, J A N E S E Y B O L D.com, or on Facebook, Jane Seabold Psychic Medium. Beautiful. And for anyone we have enticed, I have put together my very first conference. We call it We Don't Die Boston, which is February 22nd through 24th, 2019. Um, it will be cold. It will be winter time, but I have a plan that includes your meals so you don't have to leave the coziness of the hotel. And we're putting together just a really special, special, I think once in a lifetime trip besides Jane. I'll be there speaking, of course, but um, the scientist from Brazil, Sonia Rinaldi, is coming up from Brazil just for this. And she's got the most incredible pictures also of people in the afterlife and talk about her 30 years of recording voices for parents of deceased children. Scott Milligan, who was actually the guest on the last episode, he will be there. He is a physical medium. There's going to be medium readings, platform demonstrations every day. There's going to be plenty of people you can talk to privately if you'd like to do that. I've got a great guy who is talking about signs from our loved ones. He lives here in Massachusetts, Joe Higgins. I've got a great couple coming from Scotland as well. And um, attorney Stephen Masick will be there. He's not just a attorney, he's a, he's a medium. So there's a lot of information about 
the afterlife. And I say you could be somebody who's grieving or has questions or just wants to have a weekend filled with love and you can walk out the other side really knowing that you're a soul having a human experience. You're loved by beings in this world and the other world. You'll have no doubt that the afterlife is real. So if you're somebody interested in that, you can go to we don't die boston.com or check out more information at we don't die radio.com. Jane, it's coming to the end here. Do you have some closing words or anything you can just deep reach down into your soul? Any bits of inspiration or anything else you want to share? Just to the audience out there, you know, I followed Sonia Rinaldi. I know she's absolutely fabulous. I love her work. Um, If you are on the journey, I would say be there. Because when you're in with like-minded people, things will start to open up. And it sounds like a fabulous, fabulous gathering of people. Um, I would just say people come. Thanks for that. And I'm really excited myself, really excited. So it'll, it's just... I am too. Because I think we all look for that. That we all look for that time and that place for something to connect. Mm-hmm. And I can say it, it happens for a lot of people. So I would say show up. That's yeah. just a, sometimes we just don't know what we're doing in life, and all we can do is we can show up and then we'll let you know the rest happen. Yes. Yeah. And sometimes the commitment is the hardest part because everything in our system will give you a reason why not to. But if I could actually give you the feeling that I've experienced at so many other events, and that's why I'm addicted to going to them. And I thought, darn it, it's time for me to start putting them on to make it more available for people. So Jane, once again, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we'll see you in Boston. And I hope to see everybody else there too. Yeah. Did I cut you short on a thought that you had? Um, Just that sometimes if you're in indecisive, it's because we have this old patterning that doesn't want us to move forward. And I would say show up anyway. Mm. Do yourself a favor, show up anyway. Yes. Neil Donald Walsh has a great quote, which... It's on my refrigerator too far for me to see, but it's something like our dreams fulfilled are outside of our comfort zone. Everything is outside our comfort zone, but show up. There will be a lot of people there that you can resonate with that will help you on your path. Yes. And on, we don't dive, um, let me back up on, we don't die boston.com. I have a short video that gives more information. So even if you're a single traveler, you can come. So we're there to help as well. So again, thanks to our guest. Her name is Jane Siebold. You can go to janesiebold.com. And thank you to our listener. Thank you so much for being here. As always, our home base is we don't die radio.com, where now you can find 284 powerful episodes that will have you believe that we don't die, that your loved ones are still around, that your life is for a purpose. In closing, my name is Sandra Champlain. I've been your host on We Don't Die Radio. And I do believe that life is an education for the soul, that your life here on earth is important. And as Jane said, think of your loved ones, say hello, get the communication process started with intent. So I want to thank you for listening and we'll see you soon. 